Welcome everybody. Now, first I'd just like to pay uh, my respects to the Ngunnawal people on whose land we're meeting. But we should also remember all um, past Indigenous peoples uh, from Sydney Cove all the way to the Kimberleys who suffered from the onslaught of white settlement. So now, as most of us uh, will know, in April 1789, a catastrophic epidemic of smallpox swept through local tribes near Port Jackson. This was a time when Aboriginal tribes were actively and successfully resisting settlers from the First Fleet. This outbreak was recorded uh, by several fleeters, for example, David Collins, and he wrote, Early in the month and through its continuance, the people whose business called them down the harbour daily reported that they found, either in excavations of the rock or lying upon the beaches and points of different coves which they'd been in, the bodies of many of the wretched natives of this country. Now, I'm just going to interrupt the flow here to give some information on smallpox itself. Note how Collins mentioned that they were finding bodies early in the month. This suggests smallpox was released in late February. We can see this from the time it takes to contract and develop the disease. Now this slide shows the progression of the disease from the first infection to when it manifests. First as a dramatic temperature rise and formation of a rash and then to death or recovery. As bodies were found in early April 1789, and they were probably dead a few days, from this chart, we can see that these cases must have contracted the disease over three weeks before. The green shading indicates the timing of deaths from smallpox. This suggests the middle of March. However, if smallpox was first spread by blankets, the first cases are not usually fatal as the infection is only through cuts and abrasions on the skin. It is when these first cases subsequently infect their colleagues who breathe the fresh virus into their lungs that fatal smallpox emerges. So the first release was probably a fortnight or so earlier. This suggests late February or early March 1789 and we will have a close look at this period later. Now the outbreak may have killed over 90% of nearby native families and maybe three quarters or half of those between the Hawkesby River and Port Hacking. It also killed an unknown number of Jarvis Bay and west of the Blue Mountains. Now in the past some authors have argued that the First Fleet had no involvement whatsoever in the outbreak and there is a huge array of misconceptions by several academics who seek to de deny British responsibility. And I'll deal with three main arguments here. The first argument of denial argues that the bottles of smallpox carried by the First Fleet would have been sterilised by heat experienced by the fleet as it crossed the equator and during two hot summers in New South Wales. Now we know the First Fleet had bottles of smallpox. This was reported by a Marines captain, Captain Tench. And two authors maintaining that the material was inactive due to heat are Judy Campbell and Alan Frost. However, these two did not look at the temperatures recorded during the voyage or at Sydney Cove. Also, they did not refer to any of the research on how smallpox virus in scabs lost activity over long periods in normal circumstances. When this is done, it is clear that the first fleet bottles of smallpox may have weakened somewhat, but clearly could still retain plenty of virus if released in large amounts. And the details of this were published in the journal Aboriginal History in 2007, practically 10 years ago. Now this slide shows that even if the virus weakened to around half strength, it could easily have caused the epidemic if spread amongst local tribes. So after six years, there's still at least 12,000 viable particles in each individual scab. 
Now we do not know how fresh the smallpox materials were as they are not listed in the official list of medicines supplied to the First Fleet. Possibly they are obtained in Rio de Janeiro or even Cape Town. Now the second main argument that the First Fleet was not responsible for smallpox is the Macassan argument. This argument appears to have originated as a corruption of several reports to the Royal Society of South Australia in 1882. These reports suggested that Macassan visitors may have communicated smallpox in the 1860s with no relevance to 1789. Nonetheless, several authors have tried to associate Macassan visitors with the 1789 outbreak claiming it was caused by smallpox from the Celebi Islands 3,000 miles away, which just happened to coincide with European settlement. In, now, this slide just shows the track from uh, Sulawesi or Celebes from Makassar down to two sites on the uh, North Australian continent and the associated trade routes. And you can see that the January trade winds uh, bring uh, the boats from Makassar and then the July trade winds in the opposite direction take them back home again. In 2008, the, the Macassan theory was refuted in the Journal of the Royal Australian Historical Society by Craig Meir. However, it was revived by the Cambridge History of Australia published in 2013. And this publication by Cambridge University was substandard and lazy as it did not understand the complexity of Aboriginal trade and communication lines, nor the relative isolation of the Cumberland Plain, which we can see here. We know the Macassans set up temporary camps along Australia's northern coastline while processing sea cucumbers for the Chinese market. However, there was no smallpox at Macassar around the time of the First Fleet. The Dutch maintained medical services there for most of the 18th century and the very first report of smallpox only occurred in 1789, far too late for it to have caused the First Fleet epidemic thousands of miles away near Sydney Cove. Furthermore, if smallpox entered northern Australia and spread across the continent, it would have left telltale evidence in the form of pockmarks along several of the spreading native trade routes as shown here. Children along these routes who suffered smallpox in the 1780s would have been in their 40s when Europeans started spreading from Sydney Cove but there are no reports from early explorers of smallpox scars in inland Australia consistent with the Macassan theory. On the contrary, as late as 1824, explorers arriving into different areas were reporting that smallpox was unknown amongst Aboriginal tribes, that local clans were free of disease and that their skins were sleek and without a blemish. So it appears there was no smallpox spreading across Australia in the 18th century. Now, the third main argument argues that the outbreak was not smallpox, but a severe form of chickenpox. This argument has been promulgated recently in the Sydney Morning Herald and in the Canberra Times. Hypothetically, a first fleeter with shingles could have infected Aborigines with this virus, which then manifested as a virulent form of chickenpox. However, every eyewitness were unanimous that the disease was smallpox. When the chickenpox theory was floated by Richard Hickston in 1985, it was immediately rebutted by a leading virologist, Professor Frank Fenner. Professor Fenner specialised in smallpox and noted that if chickenpox was present, it would have been seen amongst First Fleet children. Fenner also raised another problem. In late 1828, smallpox erupted in central New South Wales. A military surgeon, John Mayer, investigating the, the epidemic, reported that those natives with marks from previous smallpox were now immune from catching the disease. Now the point here is that no other disease but smallpox could have arrived with the First Fleet to generate this immunity. Mayer's report therefore clearly demonstrates that the earlier outbreak was true smallpox. 
Extracts from Mayor's report have been available since 1919. They were published by the Australian Government in John Cumston's History of Smallpox in Australia. It is now not reasonable to reintroduce uh, chickenpox theory today without addressing the issues raised by Fenner nearly 30 years ago. First Fleet surgeons would have been able to distinguish severe smallpox from chickenpox by the nature of the pustules and their distribution on the body. Now, the next slide is a bit graphic, but this is exactly what would have confronted the first fleeters. Here we see very few pustules on the torso and very dense pustules on the extremities, the hands and the feet. Chickenpox is ex the exact opposite. Most chickenpox eruptions are on the torso with fewer eruptions, if any, at the extremities. Another difference is the nature of the pustules. And as First Fleet uh, surgeons examined uh, cases closely, their opinions must be taken as accurate. It is not possible to confuse an epidemic of severe smallpox with any other disease including chickenpox. Also it's worth noting that when smallpox was eradicated, most of these other supposed diseases also disappeared. So now we'll turn to the main issue. Was the release a deliberate act and by who? Aboriginal oral history has probably always known that the British were responsible for smallpox. However, it was Noel Butlin who famously brought this to the attention of the wider community. In 1983, Butlin wrote, smallpox could have been used deliberately as an exterminating agent. It is possible and quite likely the British deliberately opened Pandora's box. In 2001, Dennis Foley published an example of oral history. According to Foley, the oral tradition reported that at Balmoral, there were blankets with red markings, a stripe of words or a crown, and that those who took the blankets died a horrible death of fire under the skin and the pus of a thousand festering sores. This oral history is particularly useful because it can be corroborated independently. The description of a stripe of words or a crown is similar to navy blankets of the era. Examples as replicas can be seen today at the National Maritime Museum in Sydney, which is on this slide. First Fleet blankets would have had lettering from the symbol of George III that was branded on government property. The description of fire under the skin is accurate, as it is also the description given by those who suffered smallpox elsewhere. And the, <coughs> and the location of Balmoral is also accurate, as this is a site where numerous remains have been found, as we can see from the strange concentration of skeletons mapped here in 1964. There are also concentrations of remains near Narrabeen, Botany Bay and Middle Harbour, plus on the north side of Port Hacking. These are consistent with the release of smallpox at Balmoral and at Botany Bay, with some natives dying as they fled north and south. We now need to consider who could have released smallpox and why. It should come as no surprise that the British released smallpox, as they had already used it against North American tribes on more than one occasion in the 1760s. While this tactic was never reported in official records, it certainly was recorded in British culture. Here is an example. In 1826, the Sydney Gazette referred to selling blankets full of smallpox to uncivilised nations. And using smallpox was also advocated by a British major, Robert Donkin, and he spent some time serving with the Marines. It is worthwhile having a close look at the circumstances impacting on the four companies of Marines sent out to protect the settlement. The main problem for the Marines was they departed England in May 1780, 1787, but left all their ammunition behind. They also left their tools to repair their flintlocks behind as well. 
So when the fleet pulled into Santa Cruz in June 1787, Governor Arthur Phillip sent a plea back to Evan Nepean at the Home Office requesting that the missing ammunition be sent out with William Bly's ship, the Bounty. Presumably, presumably this was the only reason Philip felt it was safe to continue the voyage beyond Cape Town. Now the critical point here is that unfortunately the missing ammunition was never sent. Although the Marines obtained 10,000 musket balls at Rio de Janeiro, but this was only 50 balls per musket, this would not have lasted more than 12 months. Musket balls by themselves are pretty useless as you need cartridge paper and gunpowder. Also, this supply was so insignificant that even after obtaining his 10,000 musket balls, Philip sent another letter to Evan Nepean seeking more musket balls, cartridge paper and repair tools. And then, once established at Sydney Cove, Philip yet again sends a request to England for ammunition and tools to repair their muskets. But by now, it was too late. By 1789, the Marines would have thought that their supplies requested earlier had been sent, but that the ship must have met with an accident and therefore that their supplies were never going to arrive. This must have created serious concern. And there is another factor. The number of Marines was just 160 privates, plus sergeants and officers, up to a total of 212. Such a small force was unable to both supervise the convicts and protect the settlement which had spread away from Sydney Cove and much less to protect some far-flung outstation at Parramatta. On this slide we see the extent of the early settlement from Major Ross's farm at Balmain, the settlement at Sydney Cove and farming at Farm Cove and Garden Cove. This is quite a large area. Captain Tench told Philip that they could not spare Marines from Sydney to protect convicts at Parramatta. Nonetheless, in October 1788, Philip ordered that a number of Marines be sent to Parramatta, and initially only 11 Marines were sent. But this seems to have been inadequate, as the number rapidly increased to 17, and then in the middle of February 1789, 21 Marines were now serving at Parramatta. On top of this, over a dozen Marines had died or were unfit for service and another 20 or so were on the sick list. Although some of these losses were made up with transfers from Marines from the Sirius and Supply, but this was just eight. We also need to recognise that the Marines' main weapon, flintlock muskets, were not effective against Aboriginal weapons. Muskets were inaccurate at moderate ranges or against moving targets. They misfired and they needed reloading after every shot. They had no rear sight and only a rudimentary foresight that was obscured when a bayonet was attached. After an initial period, Sydney Aboriginals were becoming used to muskets and less likely to scatter when confronted with them. In all these circumstances, with no resupply, and a dire need to expand the settlement, some Marines must have viewed their predicament and therefore that of the settlement as on the verge of total calamity. And the period around the end of February and the beginning of March is of interest, not only because of the nature of the disease cited earlier, but because this was when a particularly serious conflict between convicts and natives occurred. And this resulted in another death of a convict, making six in all. And this could have well have been the straw that broke the camel's back. At this point in time, the release of smallpox may have occurred as a weapon of last resort. In 2009, Michael Bennett concluded that smallpox was released from the First Fleet, but he suggested this was a deliberate act by rogue Marines or convicts. Where I differ from Bennett is that a close examination of the circumstances suggests that some official authority not necessarily involving Governor Philip, ordered the deployment of smallpox when local tribes were possibly poised to overrun the settlement and win the first frontier war against invaders. We can be confident that the spread of smallpox was officially authorised because, as we saw earlier, it occurred on the opposite side of the harbour from the settlement 
and down the harbour at Balmoral. This indicates that boats were used for smallpox deployment, which would have required official planning and sanction, because any Marines leaving Sydney Cove without permission were court-martialed. From what we've just gone through, it is clear that the disease was certainly smallpox, that it was certainly released from the First Fleet by someone with authority to take boats out of the harbour. Just when the Marines were running out of ammunition, and when they were running out of manpower, and just when it looked like they were about to lose the first frontier war. This was obviously a deliberate act by the British as proposed by Noel Butlin over 30 years ago. And here endeth the story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, It didn't take too long after the landing. Uh, 18 months. 1788. Yeah. 18 months. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're going to wipe them out. Yeah. 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 And even went down to Jarvis Bay. Yes. 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 But um, but smallpox also mm. came out at Wallaga Lake too. Now, yes. It was a yes. little bit later down the track, but it did. Yes, mm. yes. Yeah, there were several um, incidences of it. Yeah. And it's a bit funny, isn't it? Um, but that um, little report in the uh, Gazette in 1826, mm. indicating you know smallpox could be used against native mm. people. Yes. Two years later, 1828, that's when it spread the second time. Yeah. You know, so it's a very suspicious mm. thing. You know. That's right. Yeah, but, but I haven't done much in that area. But of course, all the academics say, oh no, that was Macassar, Macassar, Macassar. <laughs> But mm. it, it spread from near Dubbo, uh, where they, the British had set up Fort Wellington, the Wellington yeah. Valley, and there was conflict with the, with the native tribes there, probably Wiradjuri. Mm. So it's the same system. You have no smallpox. The British come here, they set up a fort and a colony, they have conflict, and then smallpox spreads. Well, draw your own conclusions, <laughs> you know. In the same, yeah, yeah, so it's quite That's a... That's right. Yeah. And they had a, um, it wasn't also just with the um, purchasing of the blanket, it was also with the issuing of the blanket. Yes. Because the Aboriginal gathered in certain areas for... To receive the blankets. Yeah, receive blankets. Now, I think that probably um, happened not in the for 1789 outbreak, but possibly for mm. the 1828 because yeah. that was interesting, I think it was probably Macquarie, Macquarie yeah. possibly or something. Yeah, we're gathering a part yeah. of it. But we do need people to sort of dive into all the documents and do research on all of this because mm. it's all yet to be uncovered. It's all needs to yeah, be, needs to be yeah. done and spread. And the truth needs to be told. That's right. If you, can't have, you can't have reconciliation without truth. You can't do a <laughs> you know? treaty without truth. How truth, can you yeah. do a treaty without truth? True. That's exactly right. Mm. You know, truth it's needs just to come a, forward. That's right. It's just a cover-up. Yes, yes indeed. indeed. Exactly right. That's how mm. I see things. Mm. Yeah. And we look, reading that journal too, there was a point where Philip said um, he's reporting back to Britain. Yes. And he's saying there are more, more natives here than there were supposed to be. Now, what, do you know what date he said that? Because obviously, you know, they thought people just on the coast. And Practically the first day he arrived, they were stonkered. When they arrived at Botany Bay, they'd been misinformed by Joseph Banks uh, when they were planning the first fleet in, into the Beecham Committee. And uh, uh, Banks blatantly lied. He said there were very few Aborigines at Botany Bay and they would simply retire when the First Fleet arrived and they were inoffensive. Now when Cook actually arrived at Botany Bay, they were actually strongly opposed by the local tribes. They'd say, well, rara, rara, go away, go away. Mm. And that's the story of the, of the shield, because they, yeah. they actually fired on the, they had to fire on the, on the Botany Bay tribes, to, yeah. you know, with, with musket balls to put that hole in that shield, although yeah. that's not in the official records, that, that mm. hole is the only evidence. But um, they no, did... No, it is, that's where, sorry, that's where I talked with Paul Daly, because he said yeah. that the British Museum said it was a Lancet hole. But if you go back to so, the original, they say they fired small shot. Yeah, that, 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 the records say small shot, small exactly shot. right, or bird shot. By the time they got up yeah. to Queensland, 
Yeah. They'd rewritten the account and they're saying that hole was the Lancet hole. Mm. Oh, I don't believe that for a minute. I think it's a musket ball hole. Oh, mm. I've had a close look at it. How they're doing the denial. Yes, they are. They're covering it. When yeah. it came over here yeah. to Canberra and then over in London, yeah. they were saying it was a Lancet hole. And Paul Daly wrote that up and I'm just Facebook. They're Paul, why are you saying that? I should but follow this up. read this particular day, it's, they fired small shot on the first encounter. Yeah. So they actually fired a musket balls as well. Yeah, and they said it was small shot, because you yeah. look at that hole, it's, it's obviously it's a, a bullet. Yeah, it's no, about... No, it's only little, it's only about that. Oh, I'll have to go and have and a look when I go to London. And it would be easy to do a DNA forensic test, wouldn't it? On um, the shield? Fishing. Depends what some... Yeah, that wouldn't No, hurt. no, when, 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 when it finally crosses over, the, yeah. the pressure to mm. examine that fit when it's open, you know, when I know that I know that New South Wales government has has endorsed the the reality of the shield, yeah. but moving along, we should be demanding a forensic test yeah. just to just to cancel all denial. Yes, they should be able yes. to tell whether it was a musket ball or a spear uh, that went through yeah, because of the different um, damage. Yeah. But uh, when I go over to London, I'm going to um, see whether I can have a a real look. Uh, yeah, with and take a ruler and measure. Measure it and um, take a and if you look on the back, yeah. you can see it's the woods. Yeah. So where is it located now? British Museum. Yeah. yeah. And and up. and a plastic bag and a little set of tweezers. And maybe steal it back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just a little set of tweezers to take yeah. a to take a sample. Yeah. yeah. I'm recording. Yes. Oh. <laughs> 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 we we'll lumbered. And did you know that there's some more shields in Germany? Yeah. I have heard that. Yes, yes. Roxley uh, discovered um, them. But were they from Captain Cook, or were they because when the first fleet mm. arrived, all the sailors from the eleven transports um, stole as many implements as they mm. could to sell back in the um, UK. Mm. Um, but I think the the shield that we were talking about is a is a valid Captain Cook. Yep. Artifact, and that's yeah. important. That is very important. Yeah. To yes. know that and to yeah test it and see yeah. to yes. make corrections in relation yeah. is it a, yeah. a hole or is it, is it a, a, a piercing yeah yeah yes. but uh, getting back to the point about the numerous things yes uh, uh, when they went up sydney harbour every cove was covered with, with the aboriginals mm. and even when they went up queensland and further out they would describe them as common as crows um, it was a fully populated australia Mm. Um, Here they said that the place was overrun by blacks. Yes, so there were 500 yes. <coughs> yeah. overrun by blacks. Yeah, and then when white settlement came through, they were reduced down to 50,000 by the Second World War. Mm -hmm. You know, or just before in between the walls. Mm -hmm. So it was a very tragic and and, a, and hasn't been explained properly at, at all. Um, mm -hmm. no. That's what we do. That's how we do that frontier wars, Mark. Yes. Because you've got to break that denial for younger generations to understand sovereignty. You can't yeah. understand it. The yes, process by which they lost it. The history. Yeah. Yeah. And the information is so shocking. It is so shocking yeah. that yeah. it's really hard first off to mm. accept it. Yeah. It's very hard. It's yeah. Yeah, so we haven't really explored the poisonings and the yeah. and the um, well they, they, they there are reports of them just shooting natives as a matter of sport, you know. So yeah. yes. So, it it's, so it's, it's a very sad story, actually. And in fact, this one's not a pleasant story at all. Mm. And so it's sometimes a bit hard to um, relate it, it to people. But there's a lot of um, recorded information in relation to the, the, like you were saying earlier, there just a minute ago, about the poisoning, yes. the water being poisoned, the flour, the milk being laced by milk. arsenic, yeah. and the lid strictly yeah. placed. Yeah. And was, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of that recorded yeah. in um, several different places especially one in particular, who gave his recording on um, Native History Hancock. He was interviewed on ABC mm. and he openly admitted it in an interview where he laced the milk and water and um, poisoned the water holes mm. for the Aboriginal to kill them. Okay, so is mm. that um, recording available? It is recorded, it is um, available. It's floating Island. around on Facebook. Um, yeah. Hancock. 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 Hancock.
and uh, her father was very concerned for any tins of um, strychnine that was around, you know, because they knew that it had been used for poisoning. <coughs> yeah, so it sort of all matches. Also, Dorothy McKellar. Uh, no, no, no. Well, it's not the name. There are reports in New England as well um, of um, similar stories of Aboriginals being poisoned in New England. Mm. Uh, yeah. My husband wouldn't let our kids yeah. in the bush play with empty tins yes. or bottles yes. for that very reason. That's how recent it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he was from Wiradjuri. Yeah. 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 I, think it, I think it would have been very similar to the Durick tribe yeah. of the Sydney area yeah. and also the Gundungara, who yes. were, and I come directly through both those tribes. Right. And they were. Um, as, as it says, small, um, influenza, smallpox, you name it. And the majority of the um, um, information connected to the, um, the it's a killing field yes. all around that area. Yes. The tribes, both tribes were hit heavily by armed weapons. Um, and then following that, they were forced off country and they were moved around different places out around Gob and Yass and those places and yeah. also down the east coast yeah. of New South Wales. So yeah. there's all that that needs to be weighed up when you're yeah. researching because, yeah. hey, we're still here. Yeah. I'm a survivor. Yeah. And so are many of our families yeah. are survivors. Yeah. Yeah. And also the, the real killings happened when muskets were replaced by rifles. Yes. And then they also um, would start setting up native police and indoctrinating mm. them. But it was the rifles, because there's no way the British could ever win a war just using muskets, because the, the muskets only fire once, then you have to reload the thing, and the only way to reload, you have to stand still and, and put your ramrod and put your primer in, and an Aboriginal can throw, by the time you're putting one extra shot in there, can throw you know half a dozen spears at you, which come through silently without any noise or anything like that. And there is a report up in the Tiwi Islands when they brought muskets there. They learnt quickly that if someone a distance away fired a musket, first of all there was a big spark, yeah. and if they ducked, <laughs> then the bullet would just go straight over them because the, there was a delay between right. the primer setting yeah. off the main charge. Um, so for all intents and purposes, um, as long as there were only muskets, there was no way the British could sort of settle Australia because they were just out outgunned mm. by the... Well, they also, the Aboriginal yeah. also, Hamilway and Windedine and, and um, other warriors like that, they utilised the fogs yes. in the mist. Yes. They used to hide in between them yeah. and hide behind the trees and that's where it became into, they like a spirit, they yeah. hear one minute, gone the next, yeah. because they used all different um, materials and events to yeah. hide, yeah. very yeah. similar to a spirit. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Anyway, so I don't, yeah. uh, the, the other thing is that um, we shouldn't exaggerate uh, uh, the numbers of deaths around Sydney from smallpox, because a lot of um, natives actually fled. Some went down to Jarvis Bay, mm -hmm. um, and some went as far as about Concord. They couldn't go any further because uh, different tribal territories. Um, but nonetheless, the deaths were quite substantial. Mm. And there is a theory spread by some right-wing writers in Quadrant that um, because if you can blame disease on the demise of the Aboriginals, that therefore white settlers could not be involved in any guilt whatsoever because it was all inadvertent. Can't be blamed for spreading flus, influenza, chickenpox, measles, VD, whatever. This was all inadvertent. Um, so you have to separate um, smallpox away from other other, other diseases. diseases. Smallpox, I don't think, came through the uh, Canberra region because there was no um, uh, linkage between the Canberra uh, tribe and those north of Goulburn. They were more related to the south coast tribes, mm -hmm. and but so there's only measles, uh, which did do a bit of depopulating here as well. Yeah. I have a little concern when you said it goes as far as Nara. Uh, the people when they were moved yeah. went as far as Nara. Yeah. Um, my ancestry, as I said, it goes back to Durick, Durick country and Gandagara country. And 
my ancestor ancestry they moved to Bawari, which is just around the Nara area. Okay. Then from Bawari down into Maramurain. Yeah. Gumblik who married Kumi Nalaga. Uh, further south. That's right, Milton Nulladulla. Okay. That's the Maramurain area. Yeah. And also Andy himself. Right. Um, of Gundagara. Yeah. He, he moved down to um, around Browley and those areas. It was like as if um, they moved back for their own safety or forced yeah. out of the Sydney region from their tribes, tribal area, their nation area, and then went back to the woman's country. Right, yes. Yeah, because yes. she was a South Coast, yeah. from down the South Coast. Right. And he was Darik. Yeah. And the other side was Gandangara. Yeah. Yet they ended up down on, on the Walbunja, yeah. the Dadarinji country, yeah. and yeah. those countries that related to the woman. So it was the language, uh, uh, similar languages in that all that area, was that a language uh, group? Durga, right. was down the yes. coast. Yeah, that's then right. you yeah. have Darawal, yeah. um, language speaking up. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, anyway, so yeah, mm. that's about as far as we can Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 What about, um, oh, we're still trying to track it, but in the story that white people, at least they say they can do anything, but they had a license to kill. Now, I've heard this on several accounts. Got really close to getting one, but it didn't happen. But there's a, it's just like you have a license to go get kangaroos or staghorns in the forest. There was a license to kill Aboriginal people. Have you ever seen that? Yes, um, not a license, but there was um, a proclamation um, by one of the governors yeah, Macquarie. after Macquarie, I think, or maybe during his Brisbane. time, Brisbane. Brisbane, yes, saying that settlers were had to form together for the defence of their settlements, and they did actually, in writing somewhere, they did give permission to fire on any natives who approach settlements or something like it's that. It's in the martial law. Martial the law, martial yes, yeah, that, that was exactly right. Yeah. Now, mm. that's as good enough as a licence as far as I yeah, can no, see. Yeah, but then there were individual ones. Now, I have heard a vague thing over in WA, but there's so many rumours and that you, you, it's a bit difficult to say whether it, it, it was right. Yes, but I, yeah, but I have definitely come across that mm. accusation if, if, if you find before. One, we come close yeah. to Cowra. Yeah. where someone we know well, his daughter was working in a geriatric home with her friend, yeah. she's worried her. and this old man was waving his licence to kill around and the staff said to them, you know, he's, he's gone a bit silly, don't worry about it. But I actually know the family he came from and in, he's died now, but in that family still would be the licence to kill. Yes. In his dementia, he was waving it around the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> Must have been on his conscience. Something was going yeah. weird for yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's the closest yeah. I've got to him. Yeah. <laughs> that would have come through when you when they brought that um, ruling in under uh, what um, the gentleman was saying here, yeah, proclamation I'm of disarmament. That's 1823. Mm. I believe it's going on Before. much more recently. Yes. Much more recently. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay.